Hello, welcome to Philosophy Roulette number 179, and where we read and review philosophy live on air. It's a re philosophy reaction channel at the moment, or it's one of the things we do here. Um, it is kind of interesting. New York is starting to open up. I'm in New York area, New York City area, and we are starting to open up. So I'm going to have to, you know, I haven't been broadcasting as much lately, but I'm going to continue the series, I believe, so we're going to try to keep things going. Ooh, more on slurs. I like the slurs. Had a nice paper by uh, uh, Richie uh, a while back and on slurs, and that's always good. Uh, Kate Richie, that was. Active by Theoretica. Active by Theoretica is cool, but it's just, yeah, it's a little too sciencey, so it's a lot of actors this week. And analysis philosophical. Uh, oh, interesting. Oh, as a review. Applied ontology. Scientific approach to applied ontology. One of my other projects now, I'm doing a bunch of ontology just for fun. So maybe I'll talk about that one day. That might be kind of fun. Biology of causal. I'll take a look at biology and philosophy. Philosophy of biology is a great topic. I worked a bit on that in the past. Let's see what else we got on the front page here. I mean, I'm not going to do, it's like Portuguese, but they also look like they have some English. Yes, one of these English things. Although the other ones are in what? What is this? Childhood and philosophy. I could take a gander at it. I've had, I've had trouble reading papers from them um, in the past for whatever reason. I think it's just that they publish longer things. There's too much psychology. I think I've tried this. Oh, impact of unexpected benefits of other praising gratitude expressions. Complexity, usually too sciencey. Dialogue and universalism. Ooh, don't know if I've seen that in journal before. That could be fun. All right, education, philosophy, and theory, concept of dialogue in Chinese philosophy. Ooh, that hits a lot of different uh, topics. And episteme, always good. I like me some epistemology. So let's do a quick look-see here and see what we got some of these journals okay huh so this one is 1 to 22 there's probably not meant to be a space between this two here and this two here all right so let's see what else we got from alice dick and counterfactual cognizer active inference biological they have 1 to 45 oh that's kind of funny they've got some uh problem with their page rendering here Microbiome causality for the reflections. I wonder what this is without a, uh, it's probably a review of some sort. Ooh, one to five. Oh, this is a special, uh, I've seen this before. This is a special, um, this is just the introductory paper. Okay, so I've seen this stuff from there down, so nope. Childhood and philosophy. Mm. Huh. I don't know what this, I mean, is this in English or not? I don't know. All right, let's take a quick look. What do we have? One to five. So that's this one, this one. The philosophical baby and Socratic orality. Huh. All right, and this one is approximate. Wait, is this in like two languages? Maybe it is. Maybe that's what's going on here. All right, so maybe I'll come. Let's see if this is available because it's 11 pages. I know a lot of journals, I mean, Brazil is actually a great place for philosophy. I mean, I don't know how the job market is, but I mean, there's some fantastic philosophers down there. So, I mean, the people are excellent. So, let's see. This looks like an open access journal, just looking at this sidebar. Um, full text, Spanish. Okay, that's too bad. So, they put the abstract in English in case you want to do it. Let's just take a see if I can grab it quick, see what this is. Let's see if I can just if I want to just make sure I'm not uh, wrong footing these people. Okay, no, it is in a a language I can't I don't know. <laughs> okay. My apologies to the authors. But that's a uh, was cool that this uh, paper, this journal is open access. I like that a lot. So let's see. All right, here we go. Ooh, 1 to 14. Hey, what's up, Midnight Fog? 
How are you? Let's see. Dialogue in Universalism and Universalism and Dialogue. 19 to 33. That's 14 pages. Communicative Rationality and its Preconditions. That is 15 pages, it looks like. Let's see if we get something a little shorter. Huh. Uh, there's a something. Uh, sorry. There's a historical thing on Janusz yeah, Krasinski. What is that? Well... Which is what? I mean, sometimes what I get myself up to is I read philosophy papers and just give you my honest reaction in real time. So we're just trying to see. Good as a car. So I'm just going over what's available right now that's not like overly too long. See, these there's 15 pages here. I'm trying to find something short and sweet to read. The sense of existence in Marxism, Christianity, and liberal mass culture. Huh, 11 pages. Let's see if that's available sense of a new history oh this is all like one dude or woman i don't even know what is hermeneutic philosophy let's see this is 13 pages let's take a look at that too the phenomenon of fanaticism hmm okay so this, this person's 80th birthday so there's a dedicated issue to this person but let's take a look let's see if these things are available oh i don't like that let's see find on scholar no, not available. Let's see if it's... Sometimes it actually is there, but Google doesn't have it. Nope. I don't have that access. What about this one? Nope. All right, so that's too bad for this journal. Well, I... You know, it's that's an interesting question. I like the idea that people like what I'm up to, but I, in some sense... I can't guarantee that anyone's going to pay attention to philosophy. The number one reaction I get from authors, because I email everybody when I uh, do a review of them, is, oh my god, thank you for reading my paper. I'm so happy that someone read it. Like, literally. They don't even, like, so few people read this stuff that it's, um... <laughs> I mean, I, I'd love to get a lot of people more interested in this stuff, but what are you going to do? It's just very hard. Okay, the innovation of education and socialism in Vietnam. Interesting, but that seems more sociology than philosophy. Hey, what was that one that, um, oh yeah, what was that? It's the forthcoming paper. Love and social distance in the time of COVID-19, the philosophy and literature of pandemics. That could be very cool. Uh, let's see. So, fighting the tide, facing, huh, let's see, race, education, social mobility, all right, so maybe, let's see if I can get a hold of any of these things, these look like fun, well, let's just get the COVID-19 one, let's be, um, see what this is, oh, if it's not available, that's always so sad. Hmm. Let's see if I can get the. This is free access, so that's great. Let's get the PDF and see how long the PDF is. Ooh, six pages. That is really short and sweet. Oh, it's an editorial? You know what? I haven't done an editorial in a while, and I might as well, so. Because I like short and sweet, so. Oh. Thank you. You know, I almost did it today. I appreciate you stopping by. Um, I'm going to try to do some more European-friendly streams in the future. So uh, thank you for stopping by. But yeah, I'm going to do some maybe more in the uh, earlier afternoon so you guys have a chance. Okay. So this is Love and Social Distancing in the Time of COVID-19 by Michael A. Peters. Thank you, appreciate that. Okay, cool. Okay, so it's an editorial, but so what? Let's uh, jump on in. Okay, so. Love and social distancing. The next pandemic will erupt, not from the jungle, but from the disease factories of hospitals, refugee camps, and cities. Yep, that sounds right. COVID-19 marks the return of a very old and very familiar enemy, 
throughout history, nothing has killed more human beings than the viruses, bacteria, and parasites that cause disease. Not natural disasters like earthquakes or volcanoes, not war, not even close. Ain't that the truth. It's always one of those things like we think we are, it's just me rambling, but we think we're like important and we kill a lot of people, but like compared to like nature, we're just, I mean, we can kill ourselves, but we just, in the history of things, we kill some of us, but nature kills all of us. <laughs> okay. Onward. There is a literature of philosophy of viruses of the plague and epidemic and the pandemic. Yeah, see, back to philosophy biology. That's awesome. Albert Camus' The Plague is a classic example of the ex existential philosophical novel. Camus' attitude is that in a world without meaning, the plague provides a moral opportunity for people to find themselves in the struggle of sacrifice to work for the greater good. What's true of all the evils in the world is true of, plagues, of plague as well. It helps men to rise above themselves. As I commented in relation to Camus' The Plague, empathy is a prerequisite for a healthy world and empathy dem demands community. Jacinda Ardem, Ardern Maxim is act as if you had COVID-19, which is a complete ethical reversal designed to sensitize the population and create community cohesion. It's the perfect principle that enhances moral life as, a, as simple as the folk wisdom put yourself in someone else's shoes. The as if helps to give it the force of a moral law expressed as a moral obligation to the other. This is a known uh, thing um, outside of this paper, but any sort of disaster thing all the like outstanding like the old sort of like social uh classes tend to fall away like black white rich poor it doesn't matter um when you're in disaster everyone's people you're just trying to help everyone and then it gets very awkward like the next day when like you've got like these super rich people that were relying on these super poor people and then like they feel bad for the poor people and it's like yeah so everything gets very awkward very quickly but during the uh the tragedy as it's unfolding like every all the old societal like classes fall away and so there's an interesting sort of thing where like it takes um one of these plagues to do this sort of moral empathetic thing to us so that's a good question does society just kill our empathy maybe the philosophy of pandemic is truly a philosophy for all peoples. It reflects not only the human significance of pestilence and plague or the rise of modern viruses like COVID-19 that show the transition across species, but also themes of individual community, self-interest, and collective responsibility, the sacrifice of first contact health workers, and all those who in the ethic of the other provide a level of care in a neoliberal age less bound by duty or ethos of service and more by market values. Yeah. The philosophy of viruses and pandemics is often conceived of as an ethics of self-isolation and of the human effects of so, so, uh, social isolation, as well as its community breaches. Such a philosophy may be also seen as an ethics of care for those infected and duty of treatment, Heidi Malm and her colleagues argue. Numerous grounds have been offered for the view that healthcare workers have a duty to treat, including express consent, implied consent, special trainings, reciprocity, and also the social contract view, and professional oaths and codes. Huh. Okay. I mean, what do... Why should the health industry have more responsibility in a pandemic? Granted, it's sort of their area of expertise, but I mean, like the frontline people, this isn't their area of expertise. I mean, it's Dr. Fauci's area of expertise. Sadly, we only have one Dr. Fauci. They critically examine these grounds to find that generally they are asserted but not adequately defended. In their inquiry, inquiry, they argue none of the defenses is currently sufficient to ground the kind of duty that would be needed in a pandemic because they do not take account of the conflicts faced by health health workers who are exposed to vulnerability in the front line experience ethical conflict. Well, let me read this again. They do not take account of the conflicts faced by healthcare workers who are exposed to vulnerability in the front line experience ethical conflicts with separation from family and long hours, as well as the possibility of deadly exposure. The duty of treatment and ethic of care requires a situational logic that modifies modifies the flat universal universalism of an ethical imperative with real life cases experience and sacrifice where frontline workers offer themselves in the service of fellow citizens even at huge personal cost there is also the ethics of self isolation and social distancing the epidemiology <laughs> uh both philosophy and science terms now 
the epidemi- epidemiological profile of at-risk groups in relation to COVID-19 with a clear disproportional probability affecting the 70-plus age group and especially men who suffer from compromised respiratory diseases, diseases has not been lost on the young millennials who were caught partying in Florida during Easter break with the predominantly younger Australians sunning themselves on Bondi Beach after various lockdown measures and social distance distancing has had been announced. Perhaps the best case of contravening the ethics of social distancing that relies on the responsibility of people to keep a two-meter distance from each other is panic buying where everyone standing in long queues very close to other consumers with their laden supermarket trolleys filled to abundance with rolls of toilet paper. The panic buying for self-isolation and staying at home easily slips into a siege mentality. It was clearly evident in New Zealand and Australian supermarkets where consumers compromised all safety standards to stockpile household goods, even though they had been repeatedly told that the supply chains are intact and that supermarkets will be open and will not run out of goods. Yeah, um, I don't, maybe that, in, that was the case in Australia, but here in the United States, that's not what happened. We have basically just in time uh, supply chains, meaning that everything has got very, very little, uh, very short, very thin margins. So if any, because normally under all normal circumstances, there is no problem with our supply chain. But as soon as any disruption at a big level happened, our supply chain went bad. And there was a very long time where, like my local supermarket, they had people guarding whatever, like paper towels and toilet paper they had. And I saw a guy try to buy two rolls of paper towel or two like packages because they had packages then and the um checkout uh cashier woman just said sorry only one just grabbed it and took one away from him and he there were people guarding it at the time so that means he had hidden the other one and had got to go back because they were there was like two people there there was no like sneaking up and grabbing them you had to like be sneaky about it um like some like more than just regular sneaky you had to like hide the first one so um, this is the question, like, a lot of the philosophy of medicine in the West, at least, I don't know how it is in, uh, like, because I think the traditional Chinese medicine is different. Um, we see th- the health as a war, and it's a battle, and that's why we get into these, in some sense, siege mentality right here. This is a, in some sense, part and parcel of how we describe, um illness it's that some that you're being attacked by a uh disease you're being attacked like it's a war mentality and so it's not surprising that people immediately go to siege mentality when we are at war in some so, so a healthcare war in this case but that's how we describe it and so that's really one of the biggest problems is that um when you're not at war, people just like they don't do things. When you're at war, you act differently. And when you're thinking of it as a war, you act differently. Because you, when you're at war, you can do siege mentality. And when you're not at war, you don't care. Like it's like, well, what, what's the problem? No one's, no one's under attack here. Cause, so it's very uh, personalized, especially here in the, the states where you've got the uh, sort of like that sort of mentality to begin with. But the the war like uh, understanding of things is really at odds with the medicine. Uh, at these points okay so that's this little bit over here Uh, let's continue yet in these cases it could be argued that these people act at one level uh, this person has long sentences hold on these people at one level act from fear or self-interest despite clear information and also national arguments for the greater good on the one hand they are fearful and display their behavior as consumers pa- as consumers panic buying and thus also knowingly depriving others and creating possible shortages. Yeah, this is the individualism. This is an example of cumulative collective irrationality, either based on an extreme version of competitive individualism, hi, from America, rather than a form of collective community responsibility and care for the other, where it is sane and rational from an individual point of point a provisional viewpoint, but weird, crazy, and irrational from the community, public, collective, also long-term viewpoint. In epistemological terms, the, the social repeats of the social repeats of the biological. The virus exists as long as it can spread, otherwise it faces a natural burnout. Successful isolation depends on the social responsibility of all citizens to self-isolate and respect the ethical principle that a population is only as healthy as its weakest link. This is an epistemological 
epistemology question in part involving epistemological knowledge about the rate of infection and models of transmission, the way in which viruses can mediate the cell wall. What? Why is this a question of... How is this epistemological question about the way in vi which viruses can mediate the cell wall? That's weird. I mean, uh, it's confusing to me. Um, it can do all this stuff, but like... It's a question, how is the cell wall the epistemological question in social groups? Okay, maybe it's, um, I mean, there are multiple epistemological questions. One of them has to do with the actual uh, vector, but, okay. Continuing. Epidemiology is a science of measurement of disease in relation to a population at risk. Clues to etiology come from comparing disease rates in groups with different levels of exposure. Yeah, so in some sense, you have to do group level. I thought that's what I thought was going on here. You've got group level things, and then you have a group level epistemology. But there's also the cell wall epistemology, too. How does the virus actually act? Some philosophers have addressed themselves to moral risk and science within a democratic society, and others to traditional themes of so social isolation, self-alienation, and seeming absurdity. Philip Kitcher discusses the ineffectiveness of screening in America that increases the rate of the rate rather than lowering it and suggests the USA follow the example of two weeks of social isolation. The philosophical significance of pestilence and plague in human society, its religious interpretation as God's wrath, and a and a spiritual punishment, its symbolic representation and political emergency uses, uses Agamben's state of exception, clarify the meaning of human being, of self-isolation, of suspicion of the other, and whether there is indeed meaning outside human communities. The contagion novels of the 20th century give rise to the novel post-apocalyptic fiction and its place in modern literature. St. Sebastian, who died in 288, was a patron saint of plague victims, exemplified a selfless martyrdom that was common theme in the Renaissance art and returned in the modern era. As John Dug Dugdale of The Guardian notes, Margaret Adward's Madame Trilogy, Dan Brown's Inferno, Louis Wegg's Plague Times Trilogy, Terry Hayes' best-selling thriller, I Am Pilgrim, and the TV series Utopia, stories about pandemics, whether already raging or in danger of being unleashed, are currently rife, drawing on past outbreaks, but also seeming to uncannily anticipate fears of the Ebola virus. While such fictions can often be formulaic or trashily sensationalistic, sensationalist, the theme of infectious diseases has long attracted illustrious authors. Jeffrey S. Sarton notes that infectious themes dominate horror fiction dating back to Babylonian and Hebrew texts, to certain pivotal texts of Victorian horror fiction, and the birth of horror movies. Oh man, go watch uh, 28 Days Later, I love that movie. Michel Augusto Riva, Martin Benedetti, and Giancarlo Cesana, reflecting on the nature of pandemic fear in literature, provide an analysis of Jack London's 1912 The Scarlet Plague as one of the first examples of post-apocalyptic fiction novel in modern literature. As they note, London's early novel in this modern tradition reflects the ancestral fear of humans towards infectious diseases. They write of the calamity of pestilence and plague in the ancient world, where pandemics were seen to be provoked by offenses against the gods. They also mention Boccaccio, Boccaccio and Chaucer, who commented on the themes of corruption and greed in the time of the plague, and Mary Shelley's The Last Man, and Edgar Allan Poe's short story, The Mask of the Red Death. They conclude, even though it was published a century ago, The Scarlet Plague represents the same concerns we face today as demonstrated by the subsequent great success of this novel and the continuing literary topos of plague. Indeed, in the following decades, London's novel inspired other literary works, including Earth Abides by R George R. Stewart in 1949, I Am Legend by Richard Matheson in 1954, The Stand by Stephen King in 1978, as well as modern blockbuster movies such as Twelve Monkeys, 28 Days Later, Woo, 28 Days Later, Car Carriers and Contagion. Yeah, so, I mean, Twelve Monkeys, um, yeah, classic Bruce Willis, uh, Brad Pitt, um, Romp, and I'm, bl I'm blanking on the uh, female lead's name. I'm sorry about that. Uh, but she was good, too. But, yeah. Uh, yeah, we do like these this sort of uh, stuff. I think it does speak to what I was saying earlier, that when we get out of our normal sort of uh, social graces, then it becomes a very uh, unifying and, like, uh, group sort of thing. But it also gives a, as I think maybe 28 and 12 monkeys, 
I mean, it's sort of like you can do bad things because you have to save the world. And so these people with the uh, post with the apocalyptic sort of mentality, as the lady uh, lead in that uh, movie uh, discussed quite actually extensively, it's like they think they're special. And so this is sort of a mania, too. And so I think that gives a certainty and a purpose to people and people like that. Uh, the question of what sense of purpose there are, uh, hearkening back to the beginning of this essay where they were talking about giving people a sense of purpose in a, uh, when they might not otherwise have it. All right. Severance is a 2018 pandemic zombie dystopian novel by Ling Ma. Apocalyptic satire traces. Yeah, this is a weird sentence. Sorry. Let me try and reread this. Severance, Severance is a 2018 pandemic zombie dystopian novel by Ling Ma. Apocalyptic satire traces which traces Candace Chen, a millennial first-generation American and office drone meandering her way into adulthood. Welcome to America. Yes. Station Eleven is a 2014 novel by Emily St. John Mandel that explores a viral pandemic, the Georgia flu, that has exploded like a neutron bomb over the surface of Earth, wiping out almost the entire global population. The Traveling Symphony, a traveling roadshow that entertained what is left of small-town America. The post-apocalyptic novel in modern literature that focuses on contagion and the pandemic is also the basis of zombie dystopian themes that have gripped postmodern novels, movies, TV, and popular media. Zombies have a complex literary, literary and film heritage derived from folklore. Zombies from the Haitian, French, and Haitian folklore to depict a dead body reanimated re through magic, which experienced an upsurge of popular culture so that zombie culture is found in horror and fantasy genres. Zombie is first recorded in 1819 by English, in English by a poet in the history of Brazil. Literary antecedents ranging drawn on European folklore of the undead, including Mary Shelley's Frankenstein and an early film White Zombie, directed by Victor Halperin, starring Bella Lugosi. Popular culture drawn a new version taken from George A. Romero's Night of the Living Dead, inspired by Richard Matheson's 1954 novel I Am Legend. Michael Jackson's 1982 music vi video thriller broke all box office fillers. Boy, is that a great video. The zombie metaphor of the undead is a spin on contagion and pandemic, but also reflects consumerism, public health, and politics. The indoctrination of the public by social media conspiracies and youth via the education system are also examples of zombism, especially when the students are expected to regurgitate information. Yeah, um, this is a very famous sort of... There's always malls and zombie... Uh, movies because malls have to be there for whatever reason because basically a lot of times it's criticizing the like blind consumer culture and so you're all, there's always like a mall scene or something like that it has to do with shopping um just do what the uh capitalist overlords tell you if anybody out there has any questions concerns please let me know i will try to answer your questions but this is my first time reading it too so i'm guessing along with you the figure of the zombie heightens a cultural anxiety of loss with the mysterious outbreak of highly infectious plague that transforms people into the living dead the covid19 virus can apparently survive the hard surfaces for up to 72 hours some commentators argue that these apocalyptic fictional narratives provide an opportunity to work through the trauma of the breakdown of ethical frameworks after globalization. Yep, this is definitely going on. Um, and to deal with the seemingly endless appetite for human violence demonstrated in a multipolar world with the rise of multiple forms of terrorism and shown in all forms of media. Well, we always liked our um, sort of heinous things. Go look at the prints from the Middle Ages. It's always fun to see how mean they were to each other then too these and even if they didn't happen people like making pictures of it these dramas are essentially about ourselves and represent our ethical attempt to come to terms with deep-seated fears about death and extinction see i don't know about that maybe we just like the other stuff i don't know if it has to do with death and extinction but i mean under possibly but um maybe not in Zombie Politics and Culture in the Age of Casino Capitalism, Henry Guru seized on the popularity of zombies in pop culture, exploring the relevance of the metaphor they provide for examining the political and pedagogical conditions that have produced a growing culture of sadism, cruelty, disp disposability, and death in America. Well, um, it's definitely in America you can use this sort of thing. There was a, um uptick in, I think it was... Uh, 
either and i think it was uh, had to do with um vampires but depending on which um political uh either democrats or republicans i think every time the democrats were in power or, or maybe it was the other way around there was always an uptick in um vampire uh stories and what someone was arguing was that there was like because it, it showed like a very stark class uh, disparity between the people who are just now food and then the vampires who are the sort of like the ruling class that the rest of us are sort of like underneath because we're their food and they just sort of do this and so in some sense these sort of things gain popularity depending on how the ruling class is perceived uh politically i mean maybe that's part of what's going on now too um in pop media so but it'd be a fun thing to look at because in 2011 that's almost a decade or now Oh, God. <laughs> it was all just getting there at that point. Still in sort of the heady Obama years where you thought like, Oh, yeah, yes, we can. Everything's going to be fun. Ha. The apocalyptic tradition is deeply rooted in Judaic and Christian narratives as a sort of revelatory literature that is oriented towards the end of times, the end times. This genre and tradition has reasserted itself as a form of thinking strongly relevant to framing thought concerning philosophy and education in the end times, an anthropocentric era threatened by ecological, nuclear, and biological extinction. Sure, we've got a lot of this going on now, and so that's an interesting question as to why, um, what sort of, in the, when we're looking at these sort of, uh, anthropocentric, uh, anthropocene sort of things where we could kill everybody, what sort of media do we like to talk, look at, like to help us understand things? All right. The celebrated Colombian prize-winning novelist and journalist Gabriel Garcia Marquez, an acknowledged master of the Spanish language, wrote Love in the Time of Cholera, El Amor en los Tiempos de la, del Cholera in 1985. It was published in English, translation in 1988, and made into a movie directed by Mike Newell and released in 2007. The action takes place in the Colombian walled city of Cartagena in the late 19th century, involving a love triangle between Florentino Ariza, who falls in love at first sight with Fermina Daza, who marries her father's choice, Dr. Juvenal Urbino. When the doctor dies, Florentino immediately resumes courting Fermina. The term cholera in Spanish in the feminine form can also mean passion, as well as the disease witness the meaning of the word choleric in the English language, often rendered as bad-tempered or irritable. Choleric in Greco-Roman medicine was regarded as one of the four temperaments, along with sanguine, mel melancholic, and phlegmatic. I mean, you've got the humors is what they're talking, related to the bodies of vital fluids, blood, phlegm, yellow, black, yellow bile, and black bile. Yeah, so... Okay, history of medicine is very difficult. This is going to be a little, I mean, it's just one paragraph. It's way too quick. So that's not going to cover it, but yeah. Hippocrates regarded the four temperaments as part of the system of humorism, a concept translated from Greek kaimos that had helped to formalize insights from the Ayurveda and Egyptian medicine. Yeah, so this is like, these are very big concepts that go back forever. And frankly, they're still with us. We like to think we're not talking about humors, but a lot of times we're just talking about imbalances of chemicals in the brain. And what does that really mean, an imbalance? It means you've got more of one substance than another, and that's basically you're back in humor language as soon as you're talking about imbalances because what what's the correct balance i mean and then you're just talking about different varying levels of fluid so of course everything's more complicated but this sort of thing and how you understand health is really where this is getting to and so yeah so this is an interesting way to get into that discussion because if you can look at this in some sense health in the time of passion or disease in some sense then you're trying to understand this distinction between health and non-health and that's an an interesting way to frame this and so it's interesting um to just go the gabriel garcia marquez route but that's probably a smart thing marquez title is based in the systematic ambiguity color is both disease and passion hey Love is a sickness comparable to cholera and creates physical symptoms and effects as love sickness. Marquez is often called a magical realist, a label that defies a style that adds to and modifies realism by adding a fabulous and fantastic, a fantasy ingredient through fables, myths, and the use of allegory, often with supernatural elements presented in a deadpan way. It is a style that has come to describe a particular form of Latin American fiction that draws on fabulism and surrealism with a conceptual connection to postmodernism. This is in conformity with Leotard, who 
Just postmodernism is a state of our culture following the transformations which, since the end of the 19th century, have altered the game rules for science, literature, and the arts. Frederick Jameson in the foreword writes that Leotard opposes postmodernism not as that which follows modernism and its particular legitimation crisis, but rather as a cyclical movement that returns before the emergence of ever new modernisms. Magical realism is a historical moment in Latin American fiction, which the old justifications for meta-narratives concerning foundationalist rules for knowledge, literature, religion, or politics no longer cohere. Myth and poetics are blended into new narrative ecologies that create new genres and perspectives. Okay, so now we're getting back to the concept of how we are to understand things when in this time of... Uh, crisis it becomes a new genre in perspective and so this is sort of this interesting thing so we've got a systematic ambiguity here this is a very interesting section of this paper um because we've got this systematic ambiguity in the language and in what counts as real and not real and given that this current state of the world at the moment especially in a, the united states i mean maybe other places are different but we've really got some very systematic ambiguity ambiguity going on in um, the United States on our understanding of what's happening. And so this is um, definitely having political implications right now. Okay, continuing. Cholera as both disease and passion point to suggest suggestive parallels but not an exact an exact copy symptoms for 20 percent of people who contract the cholera bacteria experience severe diarrhea vomiting and cramp as well as dehydration septic shock and even death sometimes within a matter of just a few hours but there is fever hot temperatures and delirium delirium causes mental confusion and emotional disruption Sometimes it makes it difficult to think, or remember, or sleep. The second symptoms can be seen at, to be like a love sickness. Cartagena in the late 19th century escaped the ravages of cholera in the first cholera, cholera pandemic that spread from the Ganges Delta. The second pandemic of 1833 reached Latin America, and the 1991 to 93 epidemic killed nearly 10,000 people in Latin America. It is thought mainly from contaminated shellfish and poor water treatment. The threat of contagion creates two opposite negative emotions, the carefree extreme individualist attitude of people who think the lockdown can be disregarded and that it provides all kinds of opportunities by breaking isolation, and the other extreme based in deep fear about an imminent and painful death that stigmatizes, silences, and shames those who, who suffering from the sickness. Those who are suffering from the sickness. Both are a breakdown of the solidarity that is minimally required to protect the people. It also creates an ethos of community un uniting in citizens in a fight against the invisible virus, visually presented in scientific terms, and calling upon the community to be kind, stay home, and wash your hands. Together, we can slow the spread. Okay, so this is interesting, this paper. Um, I think, I mean, it's sort of, I, I'm, I didn't love the writing because I kept breaking up the sentences differently in my head, and so maybe that's just a difference between me and the author and what we like to read. Um, well, in that case, that means the author is right, because I usually read very painful analytic philosophy. Um, <laughs> but yeah, uh, so, but it is very interesting, especially this last section. Um, I would have liked to see more of this and some less of the, some of the other stuff, because this sort of history and literature going to sort of the current troubles that we are in here at the bottom, just above is how they were talking about, look, we've got how cholera presents a dual sort of challenge to us sort of like love and passion and then presenting sort of uh what would they say the carefree extreme individuals who think a lot can discard it and provides all kinds of opportunities by breaking isolation this was not mentioned in other any other uh it provides opportunities by breaking isolation so this was sort of what was uh, I was trying to get it before, how when there is a pandemic or some other crisis, all sorts of opportunities present themselves because of the... Sorry, someone's yelling outside. Because of what the different social order and what's going on. The other hand, and then the other extreme, I lost my train of thought, is that it breaks what people sort of think about themselves. 
So we're breaking the social things and the not. So this whole bit here is actually very interesting to me, but would have. Yeah, and then the sort of hi history of literature is sort of interesting too, but I, I like that last bit. Um, oh yeah. Then we've got the siege mentality here, which is also very good. Um, this is the contravening ethics of social distance. So once you get into a war mentality, then you sort of get war crimes, but you also get war forgiveness. Once you get outside the normal um, rules of engagement, once you're in like war rules, then all of a sudden different things are allowable. Um, and so this is sort of also something that's probably going on now. So this is a very interesting paper. I mean, it was a survey paper, an editorial. And so in some sense, it's not going to get in depth. But that said, I would have liked a few spots of uh, a little bit maybe more depth. Uh, basically here, we've got two things, I think, going on. This war mentality up here, and then we've got this sort of systematic uh, ambiguity down here. And that is really what I, I like about this paper. Okay. Um, if anyone has any other comments, I will hope to be back soon, like I said earlier, as we have a very tenuous break in the pain in the New York City area and the Northeast. Hopefully, I mean, things might get a little bit back to normal. I mean, we might have to build a wall, um, basically, <laughs> yeah, we have to build a wall, keep all those people from, like, the South out at this point. Which is just really sad, because I like Southern folks. Um, but yeah, so I'm going to have to reschedule, figure out the schedule for myself and other things going forward. And I'll try to get that published, or at least something published uh, soon. But other than that, have a great night. And I hope uh, everyone stays safe out there. And you can, of course, feel free to email me uh, anything you want me to take a look at and maybe read. So thank you, and have a great day.